Um, so what other tools are there? Believe it or not, Google can be really good. Um, you can put mutations in for genes and find articles on Google that do not pop up in PubMed. So I would use Google. Um, there are a number of prediction model um, websites that are available. However, you usually have to have access, access to a raw sequence data. So it's a, they're a little bit prohibitive. You can do population studies. A lot of laboratories will do this. Um, it, in which case you have a compilation of normal control samples, usually divided by ethnic group. And then you can simply do a digest or a sequencing test for your specific variant to see if it is present in normal alleles, and if so, how common is it? There are disease-specific mutation databases. One example here is the InFevers database, where they put in mutations identified in hereditary uh, periodic fever syndromes. There are others out there. Uh, DBSNP, again, that's available through NCBI. Um, there are functional studies. I would always um, check the NIH website to see if there's anyone offering functional studies for variants of unknown uh, significance for specific genes. Um, and then, of course, you can always call us and, and talk to us and see uh, what information we can give you over the phone. If, is there an expert that we know of who would be able to help you and so forth? Um, so usually a great first approach, though, is just trying to think about who should I test? Who could I test in the family to help us determine what this is? Well, for autosomal dominant diseases, it's fairly simple. Usually you just start with the parents. Um, usually being able to determine if something is inherited or de novo is enough. Um, for autosomal recess recessive diseases, you can start with the parents to confirm the phase of the mutations, make sure that they were inherited on separate alleles, <clears throat> or to confirm homozygosity. Uh, with traditional sequencing, you can get a homozygous a result even when actually what you have is a heterozygous point mutation and a deletion on the other allele. Keep that in mind. Um, and then you can test other affected and other and unaffected first degree relatives to see if anyone else has both changes and do they have features. For X-linked recessive disease, you can test other male relatives. And for X-linked dominant, again you can test test the mother. Um, just to confirm that she's a carrier, and then to see if she has any signs of disease, some of which can be fairly cryptic. Uh, what information is important? If you want to share information with us, we would love that. Any information is helpful. Um, pedigrees are fantastic. Um, the results of a clinical exam, you know, sometimes just telling us if you submit a family member, this person has features, this person doesn't have anything, it, can, can be enough. It gives us something to go on so that we're not making an interpretation out of complete uh, ignorance. And a lot of times we just really like to hear from you, uh, what do you think about the patient? You know, is this patient classic? Are you shocked that we didn't find a known mutation? Um, are you kind of wishy-washy on the diagnosis? You're not very sure. You know, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? You know, we, we like to hear that stuff as well. Um, so just to kind of wrap things up here. So for our SAUCE1 variant, again, just to recap, we identified it with frequency. Routine analysis was performed, and we had to assign a variant of unknown significant status to it. Uh, carrier testing of the parents was requested. We received parental samples. However, the information they provided us was conflicting. Um, so upon reviewing the cases, we got lucky in that we were able to determine that it seemed that they were all of Hispanic ethnicity. So we then went to our control samples and tested them, and lo and behold, three out of 80 control Hispanic alleles had this variant. And so it was a benign polymorphism. Not really expected for the SAS1 gene, but um, undeniable. For our array CGH duplication, um, this was a 705 KB duplication. The patient was reported to have a Pierre Robin cleft palate and autism. The genomic region is reported to vary in copy number in the normal population. Some correlations could be made between other reports of genomic imbalances in the region and the patient's phenotype. 
However, usually they were deletions, not duplications. Uh, parental samples were requested. Um, they were received, and we determined that mom was a carrier, so we could assume that it's a uh, that it's benign. However, um, that really had to be left to the um, clinician's discretion, since uh, clinical information was not provided on on the mother. So, looking ahead. Uh, as I said before, technologies are rapidly expanding our abilities to test complex disorders as well as to look at genes in much greater depth than we have before. Um, and so expect all laboratories that you use to pick up on more variants of unknown significance. Um, but also recognize that just because you get a report that just has variants of unknown significance and not much else on it, there are tools that you can utilize um, to help you come to your own conclusions. And, you know, when in doubt, always call the laboratory and, and, and err on the side of talking to us, talking to a counselor at the laboratory or to a geneticist at the laboratory. And now we're ready to accept questions on any of the talks.